Our first speaker for the morning is Dr. John Oden. Um, Dr. Oden um, is an endowed chair in pediatric endocrinology, James Hamlin II endowed chair. Um, he is a professor in pediatric endocrinology and is the chief of endocrinology, diabetes and obesity and a professor of pediatrics at the University of Arkansas for medical sciences. Um, Dr. Oden um, has been part of the uh, planning committee for this pistola, and I'm sure if um, the weather was uh, friendlier, he would be here in person. So we miss you, John. Yep. But um, everything, um, thank you for your support in the background. Oh, sure. Uh, Dr. Oden, by the way, loves to fix vintage audio equipment. So if you need ah. anyone, <laughs> you know what to call. And of course, he likes spending time with his family. Dr. Oden, thank you so much and um, for giving us this talk. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Susan, for a wonderful introduction. And believe me, um, when I say uh, repair and, and get vintage audio back up, it's more taking apart and breaking than anything else. Keeps me out of trouble, I guess. Um, I wanna thank the Pestola Planning Committee for allowing me to speak. I, I do believe, if I remember correctly, um, I was the one who uh, recommended that we have a talk on the prevention and prevalence of type one diabetes. Um, for a couple of reasons. One is I had I just had seen a, a really good discussion about um, current therapeutic options um, in the research realm. I thought those were very, very interesting. Uh, the second reason was that in Arkansas, and I'll show you this data in just a little bit, we've been seeing an uptick in, in uh, the diagnosis of diabetes overall, type 1 and type 2 in our institution. And I wanted to share that a little bit, although I think just discussing that with some of our colleagues around the um, this region, um, everybody's seeing the same upswing. And three, it's a little bit of a personal journey, uh, prevention and prevalence of diabetes for me. I was diagnosed with type one when I was 10, so that's about 40 years ago. Um, and uh, I became a little skeptical about prevention and cure because the doctors that were seeing me, it was Luther Travis at UT, um, UTMB in Galveston. Every time I would see him, he would say, okay, John, so in about five or 10 years, we're gonna have a cure, so don't worry, it's gonna be fine. And 40 years later, we still aren't much closer to a cure, but maybe after this talk, we can, we can have a little bit of a sigh of relief and say, hey, well, something may be coming down the pipe. Um, so I did wanna open this uh, discussion um, to say that I am not an expert in this at all. I mean, I had to learn a lot just preparing for this talk. M much of what you were gonna see is probably not that new. Um, some of the data from Arkansas is, although um, Amir Toss gave a really good talk yesterday, if you were fortunate enough to see it, he, he showed a little bit of our data. I just wanted to kind of open that conversation for, for these new possible therapies coming down the road and kind of begin that conversation within your divisions and say, hey, you know, how are we going to um, apply this clinically if it ever comes to pass? And then to open up the conversation as well about broader uh, screening uh, techniques. Disclosure, none. A long slide from to say nothing. Um, so thinking about broad screen, we have to define what, what screening should be for a medical problem. And the NIH defines it this way, and there are other kind of criteria that you can fill in, but you know, the disease should be an important health problem. Um, we should have a detectable preclinical pre phase. The screening test should meet acceptable levels of accuracy and cost. Uh, the screening test and follow-up requirements should, shouldn't be punitive to the healthcare providers or the individuals at risk. And there should be uh, treatment options to apply before the onset of clinical symptoms um, that would benefit the patient themselves. So just keep that in mind as we're discussing this. So what are we gonna talk about? We're talking about the prevalence and burden, um, especially uh, the data that, that's coming out of um, Arkansas Children's Hospital and UAMS. We're gonna talk about the basics of type one autoimmunity and disease progression, specifically stages um, from Dr. Richard Ensel. We're gonna talk about current screening uh, recommendations from the American Diabetes Association. And what does it mean to preserve beta cell function? What do we expect out of that? What are we measuring? 
And then finally, very briefly, a recent progress in, the pre in preventing type 1 diabetes and, and the stuff that we've done in the past um, as a community of endocrinologists. Okay, so as, as we all know, um, type 1 diabetes is a, is a significant problem, um, specifically in kids. It's the one of the leading uh, chronic diseases in children, second only to asthma. So about 1.6 million Americans are now living um, with type 1 diabetes. And about 64,000 people are, are diagnosed with it every year. Peak age is around 10 to 14, but many adults are, are um, diagnosed as well as time goes on. Males are very similar to females. But realize this was uh, data collected up until about 2015. Overall incidence is increasing based on 2015 data, 20, 20, um, 2002 to 2015 data. The overall incidence is increasing uh, by an average of about 2% per year. Of course, more in Asian and Pacific Islander and less in Caucasian. And so this is some data that I'm relatively proud of. This is stuff that I've been following since I um, took the position as a, as a division chief uh, here at ACH. Um, on the left of the screen, you see this kind of this, this curve that goes straight upwards. And each one of these um, rectangles here uh, signifies a year. So this final point here is uh, 2021. So that's uh, the end of 2021 data that we collected up until uh, December 31st, showing that we um, diagnosed around 378, 377 kids. And way back here is 2004, which was much, much less. I took uh, the position right about 2014. And I think some of this increase here is just the fact that we were um, working a little bit harder to define diabetes um, in our children and recording it. Um, putting it down in an in a Excel spreadsheet. Um, this blip here is, uh, I remember very clearly, was uh, uh, because of a December month in 2015, where we had about 30 kids uh, come in with diabetes. And thereafter, it became much more stable up until about 2018. In 2018, 2019, 2020, and now 2021, um, we have seen this rapid rise. Uh, the other piece of information that I like to collect is monthly statistics. So you see that in um, Arkansas and many places in the country, um, we have um, significant swings upward in April, in August, and in December. And many of us love to take call in November because we do see a significant decrease in the number of kids that we see with diabetes. So what does that mean um, when, we, when we categorize these kids, type one versus type two? Well, back in 2015, we were only seeing around 19% of our children uh, with diabetes, new onset diabetes um, with type two. But over the course of time, of course, we've been seeing much, much more. And so since 2017, um, where we had a 20% um, prevalence of, of type two diabetes in our kids, we are now up to 42%. Uh, the little aqua piece of that pie are, are the other forms of diabetes that we have, like steroid-induced, CFRD, um, and MODIS. But all of it seems to be increasing. And then incidence. So um, as I showed you in the slide before, the incidence nationally, uh, based on 2015, data is around 2% per year. For Arkansas, over the past couple of years, we've been seeing a steady rise in incidence, and currently, based on our data, um, that we got back in, in this last December, our incidence and rise of type 1 diabetes is um, approximately 7.8%. Type um, 2 diabetes is much higher, about 25.6%. Uh, and then overall, our increase in diabetes is 13.5%. And ashamedly, I think th these numbers are uh, relatively low for type 2. Um, we are kind of focused in central Arkansas, and we have another hospital in northwest Arkansas in Springdale. But in between, there's a lot of land and a lot of primary care doctors who, who seem to take care of kids um, with type 2 diabetes. It's not un uncommon for us to see them in clinic with a diagnosis of PCOS or insulin resistance or elevated insulin level or in elevated A1C. And they've been being treated with metformin for the past couple of years. So I think, I think these, this data is a little bit, a little bit um, of a low ball. And so with the diagnosis of diabetes comes the burden. And of course, um, we all know that there is a, a, a decline in life expectancy within people with, with diabetes and in kids 
who are diagnosed before the age of 10, there's a significant uh, decrease as opposed to after the age of 10, but it's still quite significantly different from the control group. Um, it, it's about a 17 year reduction in women when diagnosed by age of 10 and about a 14 year reduction in men. And so our children, our families with type one diabetes face uh, lifelong problems uh, for lifestyle and social. There's emotional impact of the disease. Um, and, and in a little bit, we'll talk about despite the improving um, technology and improvements in insulin medications, we still see that increased risk of complications and problems with mortality. So what about the improvements? What have they done for us? So, you know, despite um, improvements in technology such as pumps and CGMs, uh, better insulins, more rapid acting um, insulins, longer lasting insulins like Lantus, um, we still only see about um, 17 to 23% of our kids reaching the acceptable ranges of hemoglobin A1C. And that data is further um, defined by European, by European groups that show that only about 28.1% of kids who are on pumps and CGMs reach a goal of in-target blood sugars of about of greater than 70% in time. Poor glycemic control um, causes worsening of cardiovascular outcomes. Um, lower hemoglobin A1Cs on the flip side of that show that there was a 30% reduction in cardiovascular events and reduction of around 30 to 76% in microvascular events as well with improves, improvements in glucose, um, improvements in A1C. Uh, this also translates into um, higher levels of acute uh, complications of diabetes such as DKA and severe hypoglycemia, hospitalizations for hypoglycemia, and an increase in mortality in the children that already experience a, a mortality rate three times higher than um, the non-type one population. Okay, so we're gonna get into the basics of the of autoimmunity. Again, I'm not an expert in this, so forgive the knowledge gaps and um, pauses in my speaking. Um, so of course, type one diabetes is an autoimmune disease. There is a genetic predisposition. Um, that genetic predisposition has been localized to the HLA region of chromosome six. Um, some uh, mutations in this um, HLA region are protective for diabetes. And we'll get into that just real briefly in a little bit. And some of them are, are uh, predictive of diabetes or, or increase the risk of diabetes. Um, in those individuals with high risk uh, HLA haplotypes, uh, there is another event, some in environmental trigger that is yet to be identified, an infection perhaps, which uh, triggers <clears throat> autoimmunity against our beta cells, degradation of their function, finally symptoms of dysglycemia, and then dependence on insulin. Here is a cartoon that uh, signifies uh, the antibodies that are produced. Um, all of uh, all four of these are ones that we do quite quite regularly in clinic. These antibodies are detectable um, in the genetically at risk individuals by um, nine to two, nine months of age to two years. Some of them uh, peaking like insulin autoantibody and uh, GAD peaking around the age of two. With this autoimmune activation, of course, becomes, uh, it becomes more apparent pathologically um, with uh, reactive T cells invading the, the, the pancreatic um, islet bed and then uh, attaching uh, themselves to uh, the beta cell themselves, damaging and destroying them. Um, with this immune activation, there is this cartoon on the right side that kind of depicts this very nicely. With this autoimmune activation, immune regulation becomes um, disjointed. And so in 2015, Dr. Insel um, published this data. Uh, it's a very nice paper about um, the progression um, in distinct stages for uh, type 1 diabetes and defined um, kind of clinical risk factors for patients that would be genetically at risk. And so, of course, with stage 1 disease, um, we have at least the persistence and measurement of uh, uh, at least two autoantibodies at stage 2. Um, you still have those persistent autoantibodies, but your blood sugars become abnormal, either fasting blood sugar or postprandial blood sugar. Um, hemoglobin A1C between, in these two stages, however, are completely normal. And then stage three is clinical diabetes. 
So Dr. Insel also defined what was high risk versus uh, low risk individuals um, for the development of diabetes. At the far left, there's that less than 1% group, which is considered at low risk. And those are individuals who do not have a first degree relative with diabetes. They do not have a first degree relative with uh, high risk haplotypes. Um, and then on the far um, right, uh, there are those children uh, with siblings with diabetes, parents with diabetes, uh, parents with the high risk haplotypes and themselves with high risk haplotypes. And, but once in, uh, in that uh, stage one of disease for type one, uh, the lifetime risk of developing clinical stage three approaches 100%. And in stage one, where you have two autoantibodies that are positive, the 15-year incidence of type 1 diabetes in that individual approaches 84%. In stage two, it's a, a much shorter period of time, but a very similar um, um, percentage. So in about four years at stage two, you are expected to develop diabetes in about 74% of that population. You expect to see diabetes. And then, of course, there's stage three, which is defined as um, routinely as diabetes. So um, a random blood sugar of 200, hemoglobin A1C greater than 6.5, a fasting blood sugar of one over 125, and a two-hour postprandial blood sugar of over 200 or 200 or over. So we do see that in families um, with these genetic haplotypes, there's an increased risk, right? So there's a 3% risk of in, in individuals developing diabetes who have families with diabetes and have the um, uh, islet cell antibodies. But in the general population with these islet cell antibodies, um, there's only a 0.3% risk, which is still higher than the general population. Unfortunately for screening protocols, however, only about, 80, uh, about 85 to 90% of new onset cases are spontaneous and there's no family history. Regardless of how you develop it, however, once you are in those stages, in stage one or stage two, the progression into metabolic uh, type one uh, is the same, and the metabolic outcomes are the same. So they're very difficult to differentiate once those antibodies are produced. Now, what are the benefits? So um, the American Diabetes Association came out with their 2022 guidelines in January. And basically what they are saying is that um, broad uh, screening uh, strategies for um, children in general, in the general population should be kept in the research setting but they do advocate for um, possible screening in kids that are at high risk. So maybe for, uh, a child with a first degree relative, a brother or sister uh, parent. And in reading further in that text, uh, there is a strong sense that um, they would do a little bit more. They would probably recommend a little bit more if there were some appropriate therapies. And until then, they would recommend that if an individual or family is interested in uh, being screened, that they contact um, the trial net network or the European uh, network uh, for screening. Now with screening, we have found that um, finding these individuals who are at high risk um, allows us to detect diabetes at, at a much sooner age, which allows us to prevent DKA um, at diagnosis. And I'll show you those slides in just a second. That they found that population level screening is actually feasible and it can be cost-effective. Um, and then parental st stress, although it increases with a diagnosis of antibodies can be reduced with education and time. So of course, what is the importance of screening? At this point in time, it's to define those children who are at risk of diabetes, but also being able to, uh, to prevent diabetic ketoacidosis, which are associated with increase in mortality, increased hospitalization, higher insulin requirements, and a whole host of other things. And what we have found is that with screening in the general population, both in Colorado and in Germany, that the rates of DKA have de decreased. So summary benefits of screening. So it, again, we see that we uh, reduce the, the rates and risk of DKA. Um, we allow um, families to participate in research and that closer monitoring um, helps allay a lot of the uh, fears and anxieties of families. It allows them to understand what the uh, classic symptoms are and bring those to um, a doctor's attention sooner rather than later. Now, preserving beta cell function. So remember, in, in order for a screening program to, to be effective, we have to have some sort of therapeutic um, um, target. And so our therapeutic target has been to, of course, preserve beta cell function. Um, 
in the very beginning of diabetes, when we have those antibodies at about six months before diagnosis, we can see a decline in C-peptide um, uh, release. Um, with that decline in C-peptide release, of course, comes an increase in blood glucose. So there's the increase in blood glucose and there's the decline in C-peptide. Both of these run in a, almost in tandem. Um, and there is a threshold. So at about 20 to 25% of our beta cell mass, we start developing symptoms and signs. And so about 25% or greater than 25% of beta cell mass may be considered normal or maybe a, a therapeutic target to say, hey, that's, about, that's a, a really good range to keep um, our patients in to avoid symptoms. But further, increasing or, or maintaining uh, reasonable amounts of C-peptide, even in patients with uh, hyperglycemia and diabetes, um, results in improvements in both hemoglobin A1C, as shown on the left, and um, improvements in severe hypoglycemic events, uh, hospitalizations for severe hypoglycemia, and re reductions um, in uh, the prevalence of, of DKA. So is screening a feasible thing for uh, type one diabetes? In my belief, it is the only thing that we are missing uh, is a therapeutic strategy. Um, di the diagnosis of type one diabetes is often abrupt. It's often life-threatening. Um, the onset of clinical diabetes is predictable. Uh, screening can improve that cl clinical picture. We do have a target of, of um, C-peptide to keep um, to keep, keep uh, blood sugars under control. And so when we think about those screening, I put all of those things, the disease should be imp an important health problem. Of course, diabetes is. Thousands of people are diagnosed every year. There should be a detectable preclinical phase. Of course, there is. There's stage one and stage two. Screening tests should be acceptable for accuracy and cost. We all do antibodies for these people in blood sugars all the time. Um, that is not uh, cost prohibitive. It's, it's not too difficult. It's, it's found in most commercial labs. A screening test and follow-up should not be, um, it should be acceptable um, uh, to the individual, individuals at risk and in healthcare providers. The only thing left, of course, is treatment. And so a, a brief discussion about treatment, and then I'll be done and I let you guys go on with your morning. Um, so I've known some of our, our, my colleagues have, have been involved in, in some of these, um, in some of these studies, uh, rituximab and Akinra, um, are some of the are a few of the ones that I've known about the oral insulin I've never been involved in at all but those um, continue actually they're still um, uh, recruiting for a few higher uh, oral insulin um, studies so if you're interested in that it's um, on uh, the NIH website um, and then there's teplizumab um, which is something that we're going to touch on in just a second so what has and hasn't worked? So here is a long list of, of, of therapies and medications that we've tried. Cyclosporin was one of the first. And although it seemed to um, improve blood sugar control, improve beta cell function, um, it was nephrotoxic. And so the, the toxic side effects were, uh, were uh, punitive to that, to that study. All the way down to preventing um, high-risk infants from exposure to cow's milk, which had very little effect, preventing gluten, gluten exposure in infants in Germany, which had very little effect. And then, of course, the oral um, insulin um, studies, which have, have found uh, mixed results, usually not showing a whole lot in lower dose oral insulin, but higher, do um, higher doses are, are under study right now. And in a small subset of individuals with, with um, high... Um, um, insulin autoantibodies, they seem to respond better than, than those without those antibodies. So in some benefit, we do see um, the oral insulin, as I said, it's mixed, but teplizumab is the one that um, is um, most interesting to me. And although it is not FDA approved um, for any specific therapy, it does seem to have um, some significant benefits, almost cutting uh, the uh, progression towards type one diabetes in half in the, uh, high risk children in stage two in a phase two trial that was recently published um, in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine. So at that point, I'm gonna say thank you and I'm gonna uh, stop sharing my screen. Uh, I do appreciate your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Oden. Um,
I don't see, there's one question in the q and I'm, I'm wondering if you can see the question. I think so. How about calcium channel block, blockers for preservation of beta cell function? Um, yeah, so I, I skimmed over um, the titles of those. I didn't find um, anything uh, recent in um, um, the study list. So um, I don't know a whole lot about them, I'm sorry. Um, you mentioned about um, teplizumab. Um, mm -hmm. Presently, there are patients running around in the general population who are at risk. Um, do you have any recommendation on what I can prescribe or um, to help them, just keep them from progressing into stage three? Um, unfortunately, the only thing that I can say is to um, get in touch with TrialNet um, have that those individuals, um, uh, um, their antibody levels studied, uh, maybe get their HLA haplotypes. There's a, a very large um, trial net study going on now that are trying to recruit more and more patients in to get a better sense of where these antibodies come to play. Um, why in like for in teplizumab, for example, uh, the effects of that medication are more pronounced in individuals with um, anti insulin antibodies and less so in uh, the zinc antibodies. Um, it, it, in, in what ways do the HLA haplotypes in, in, interact with those antibodies, um, interact with the possibility of using things like teplizumab or other um, C3 blockers? Um, but at, at present, there aren't any um, uh, uh, clinical applications for the general population. Do you have any uh, comments on using metformin? Um, the metformin studies uh, found that although they don't directly interfere with uh, or, or directly uh, improve the progression of diabetes, there may be a, um, a role for uh, things like metformin or GLP-1 agonists uh, in the future as, as a kind of a combined um, effort with other medications. Dr. Lynch? Um, so if, if I heard you correctly, you're, you're wondering if, if we have any ability to, to look at our data and say, hey, was this directly linked to COVID? Yeah. <clears throat> That's a great question. Um, in fact, I got off the phone um, with a medical student who's interested in working on some research projects with us, and offered that as as one of the one of the um, as an outline for her to 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 start working with us. Um, Joe Thompson, who works um, with the, the state government here, is also um, impressed with this data and um, wants to to look a little bit deeper into it as well. Um, but at, at present, no, we don't have any data to support the idea that um, people were uh, admitted. Um, because of COVID and subsequently developed diabetes, nor did we measure um, antibodies. But there's, something a, there's a question in the chat. Um, I'm wondering if you can see that, Dr. Excellent. Excellent talk. Thank you. You're welcome. Would you consider starting low dose insulin therapy at stage two to preserve insulin function? So that's a great question. Um, and again, I think when we, when we look at the data for uh, intranasal insulin and subcutaneous insulin, um, the uh, uh, the effects of that were, were less than robust. Uh, but when we're talking about oral insulin at high dose and very specific subsets of individuals that they actually do have um, a, a place somewhere, uh, the, the question is, where is exactly that place and, and which people benefit the most? At present, there is this idea that um, for oral insulin that these individuals need to have a very high um, insulin autoantibody titer as opposed to other antibody titers. And in those individuals, they seem to do pretty well with some delay in uh, beta cell destruction. If you use insulin, would you use basal or bolus? To prevent diabetes? Correct. Um, well, to be honest with you, I wouldn't use either. I'm, I don't think uh, there has been enough data to support the idea that um, sub-Q insulin actually helps um, prevent diabetes. Now, when we're talking about type 2 diabetes and improving blood sugar control or finding kids that are in kind of that gray zone of stage 2 and stage 3 that, are, that have slightly elevated A1Cs, 
and you want to improve blood sugar control, I would, I personally would start with a basal insulin. Dr. Prabhakaran. Thank you, Dr. Oden. Um, can somebody repeat the question? I couldn't hear. I'm sorry. Stem cell, it's about, uh, it's a question about stem cell transplant, if you have any comment. Oh, I don't actually. I mean, I think um, a little bit different from, from what I was, what I was um, talking about, but yes, I think in, in the near future, I think we're going to see a little bit more about stem cell transplant. I've heard a little bit from our colleagues at UAMS um, with their adult um, group. They have had um, some success with the use of stem cell transplants. And what about uh, the plasma cell? The use of ECG as correct. A HCG? BCG. Oh, BCG. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, um, BCG. No, I don't have any comments on BCG. Sorry. Thank you. There's a question in the chat, and um, the question is uh, from Dr. Shea. Um, how would you start the process um, for teplizumab infusion? The procedure, the process, and who who would benefit from? So that's a great question, Heidi. I think, you know, um, we had this discussion very briefly in our uh, division meeting not too long ago because we heard that uh, teblizumab was going to get FDA approved. It wasn't. Um, hopefully, it, the second round, beginning in January, it will. Um, we have not started that process. I don't think it's going to be that difficult. The biggest problem that I foresee is getting prior approvals through insurance companies. So the process will probably be something along, along the lines of getting teplizumab entered into our formulary, uh, getting Medicaid to pay for it. Those are going to be two big hurdles. And once that's done, we're going to have to kind of work with Blue Cross Blue Shield and other uh, local insurance companies to allow us to use some sort of um, approval process to get it done. And once that's done, I think it's going to be relatively simple. We have a question here. Do lifestyle increases with do, do lifestyle changes help prevent progression? Is the question. Or slow down progression. So, yeah, so there is this idea of an accelerator theory that, you know, um, weight gain and insulin resistance causes kind of a more rapid progression of type 2 diabetes. Thus far, I haven't seen any data that supports that. Uh, there are pros and cons or are, are people that believe in it, people who don't. But in the studies that look at infants and, and change in diet, there wasn't any effect whatsoever. There is another um, in the chat, it says, is teplizumab effective in prolonging preserving beta cell function in someone who is newly diagnosed? Um, those studies were uh, performed earlier in the decade. I think it was in 2015 or um, Howard um, et al. did publish on that data, um, and they did find that it helped, yes. Dr. 